me. Yes, we can see it. Excellent. All right, everyone. Welcome, welcome. My name is Tori Liska. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm one of the, the two assistant directors for Residence Life here at Montclair State. My colleague is also with me. I'll allow her to introduce herself. Hi, I'm Janika Voltaire. I'm the other assistant director for Residence Life. So I will take the lead on sharing a wealth of information with all of you, and Janika will be in the Q&A to answer any questions. Again, as Nerys has noted in the chat, since we have so many folks on our webinar tonight, if you could just drop any questions that you have in the Q&A, Janika will work through those, and hopefully we'll answer a lot of those questions through the presentation as well. So you can see some of our social media down on the bottom of the page for your access. We do try to post really important things through our social media. So feel welcome as parents to join in and follow along. Um, I'll also note that some of uh, this presentation may look familiar if you attended any of our presentations in the fall, but we've added a lot more information that's more relevant to our parents who may have students joining us in the fall. So without further ado, in residence life, one of our biggest things is to ensure that our educational priority stays at the center of the work that we do. Our educational priority in residence life is to engage students through their holistic development as they transition from Montclair State into the community as global citizens. So we're not just thinking about how do they do in the residence halls, we're thinking beyond that. We really want to look at all aspects of their life and engagement at Montclair State and make sure we're sending them off to be great community members and global citizens. So we want them to be thinking critically. We want them to develop solutions to complex issues, to understand social justice, have a more comprehensive approach to wellness, and learn how to become advocates and allies for themselves and others. So who's going to help your students learn about our educational priority and put that into action. These are our key team players and, and team members for residence life. So we have our community directors. These are full-time master's level professionals who have been trained in student development and higher education. They oversee assigned communities. So that may be one or two residence halls or a large complex of our residence halls. And they'll work with the students that are living there, with the student staff that are also working in the building. And they're going to maintain the overall operations of that community. Our assistant community directors are graduate students. They're part-time. And they are supporting our community directors in the residence halls while also overseeing our desk operations. So if any of you have come to our campus and been to a residence hall, you know that for the most part, we have front desks that are staffed. Um, and that those desks are oversaw by our ACDs and then staffed by our student staff. So you can see we have resident assistants and service assistants. The RAs, as they're probably more affectionately known, live and work in the specific residence hall where they're assigned. So they are usually the first point of contact for our residents in the building. And then we have our service assistants who serve as a resource at our front desk or our offices and they help with safety and security. So if you're gonna visit uh, your son or daughter in the, in the buildings, the service assistant is likely gonna say, hi, welcome, and we do need to sign you, in, sign you into the community as a guest. Um, again, that safety and security is, is really important aspect of their role. And then we have other team members. So if you've emailed us, you likely have chatted with some of our administrative staff. We have our assignments housing, housing assignments coordinator who handles all of the room assignments for all of our beds on campus. And then assistant directors like Janika and I, we have associate directors and then our executive director. So it feels like a larger department, but we work with a lot of our students and we try to be as supportive as possible. So that's our team, that's the staff in our residence halls. So sometimes parents are still debating if they want their students to live on campus or not. So to highlight some of the, the main reasons why living on campus is a benefit to students. One, it's super easy to get to classes. They're not worried about a commute. They're not worried about trying to find a parking spot on campus. They're not worried if they're gonna get there on time. They can easily get to their classes when they live on campus. 
They're in close proximity to our campus resources. We have plenty uh, from our services in our student center and university hall to our counseling and psychological services, student involvement, and, and many other resources. So again, they're not worried about a commute to get to those resources. They can easy, easily get to them on campus. They're gonna meet new people. And for many of them, it's gonna build lifelong friendships. There are many different housing options on campus. We'll get to that a little bit later in the presentation, but it, they can have individual bedrooms, shared bedrooms, apartments, suites, uh, the options vary. Safety is of course important. Like we said earlier, we do have staff working at all of the main entrances to ensure safety and security. Living on campus helps students develop a sense of independence. They have access to a lot of resources as we've kind of talked about campus resources, but also other on-campus resources are there for them as well. And just the, the great community that exists. I, I will say I'm an employee, I'm usually on campus during the day, but the feeling that campus has later in the day and in the evening is, is something very different, but it's still such a great part of Montclair State. So where can students live? I, I know for the most part, the parents I'm chatting with, you have first year students who are just coming to campus, but uh, we may also have some parents who are here for a student that's transferring to Montclair State. So all of our students, including first years, can select their housing. First year students can select to live in up to seven different residence halls. And then for any transfer parents on here, we have three other halls and I'll, I'll highlight those briefly. Some students come to us with interest in different housing options. So some of those are listed here for you. We, we have a wellness community, we have a global living community, or we call it GLC, and that's for students who are interested in living with international students or students that identify as an international student. Um, our honors living community exists, and I think that's probably self-explanatory. And then we also have Stonewall Suites, which is a LGBTQA living learning community. It's uh, currently located in the, the Heights area. So th this is, you know, just a few bits of information, but let's go more in depth. So I'm going to go through each of our resident hall communities. I hope to highlight some of the most important pieces and um, we'll, we'll go from there. So Bone is the primary residence hall for our first year students. It does house a, a great majority, um, just under 800 students will, will and can live in Bone Hall. It's also the location of our Office of Residence Life. So I'm actually in Bone Hall right now. Um, located on the fourth floor and I, I live in a hallway where students used to live. So I, I get a great interaction with first year students that live here. There are a lot of resources available to them here with our writing center, which you can kind of see is the, the lower front part of the, the building in the picture that you see. Bone Hall is a traditional hall. So what we mean when we say traditional hall is, it's what most people think of when they say dorm. It's shared bedrooms, usually with just one other person, and they share a community bathroom. So let's show you what a room looks like. This is a standard uh, part of a room in Bone, so you can see the provided furniture. Uh, it's obviously staged with blankets. Uh, your students will bring their own. Uh, but students are getting dressers, a bed, a desk, a chair, and a wardrobe. They can open their windows. Um, and then there's common spaces. So you can see this other picture of a community lounge in Bone Hall. Blanton Hall is directly across the street from uh, Bone Hall and it is suite style. So what this means is that students share bedrooms and in between those bedrooms is a shared bathroom. So they're likely only sharing with three to four other people uh, in a suite style arrangement. So they're not sharing with the floor of residents, just the people that they're sharing a bedroom with and the, the neighboring side of that bathroom. First year and upperclassmen student can live in Blanton Hall. And it's also the location of one of the most popular food court areas on campus. So our, and our university health center is there. So 
again, great access to resources. And then again, back to Bone across the hall, they're also very close to these amenities by living in Bone. Here is a standard room for Blanton. Again, you can see there's two bedrooms or two, two beds here for two residents to share. And then there's a door that connects into their bathroom. And then there's actually another door that you can't see on the other side of the, the toilet and shower for the residents in the, the shared other bedroom. Freeman Hall is another option for first year students. It is a suite style community, again, similar to Blanton where there are bedrooms that share a bathroom between the bedrooms. The first year and upperclassmen students can live in this residence hall. It's also the same community with Freeman Dining Hall. So students have very quick access to uh, an option to grab food. And it is a favored community for our art students. Uh, and let's just see a room. So this is uh, a vacant room in Freeman. Again, this is a, a double space that you see. So there's, there's two beds, two desks, chairs. Uh, you can see there's a dresser tucked underneath and then there's two wardrobes, one for each resident. So pretty standard. And then beyond this, you would see a bathroom. Again, it depends on the configuration of the space, whether it's a double or triple, but students have access to bathrooms and shower stalls in their shared bathroom. So again, not sharing with the floor of residents like a traditional hall, just sharing with those individuals in the shared bedrooms. The Heights. The Heights is our largest community on campus, Ms. Voltaire, who's on the call with us, is the system director that oversees this area. It is a sweet style community. It's one of our newest builds on campus. So it's, I believe it's 10 years old now, um, but it still feels brand new. Um, students really love living in the Heights. It is for first year and upper class students. It is a large complex. So you can kind of see across this picture, the four buildings um, of Machuga Heights and then the four buildings here for Denalo. They're all connected and with a, a shared space and they all have front desk operations as well. Students really like the Heights, one, because it is where Sam's Place and Dining Commons is located. So again, a great food option on campus and the primary location that most students use, in addition to being next door to the Student Recreation Center. Let's show you a room. So this is the inside of the Heights. It feels a lot more modern to students than some of our more traditional suite style. Uh, again, furniture amenities are similar and we'll, we'll talk more about that consistency across campus. But this, this is a space. So uh, you don't have the closed wardrobe, it's an open wardrobe. And yeah, that's the Heights. So if you got any questions, drop those in the Q&A. Stone Hall. Stone Hall is one of our smaller communities on campus. It is a traditional hall. So it's actually just two floors and an annex. About 150 students live there. So it's a really small, tight-knit community. And it is traditional in the sense that it's bedrooms that are shared with one community bathroom per wing. So all the residents in that wing would share that bathroom. This is also a building that students love because it gives you views of the New York City skyline. On a beautiful clear day on campus, the, the view is just amazing. And we tend to only house our first year students in stone. This is a sample of a room in stone. Again, you're, you're seeing the, the standard furniture and setup. And the, the one with the bunk beds is actually a triple. So in some of our triple arrangements, beds are bunked. So here are some other housing options. This again is mostly available to upper class and transfer students. So depending on how many credits a student is transferring to Montclair with, or if they excelled as high school students and did college credit, they may be able to live in some of these communities. So Hawk Crossings is apartments and you need to have at least 30 credits to live in Hawk Crossings. Frank Sinatra Hall is sweet style, but it is 
more of a configuration for sophomores. Uh, sometimes transfer students are, are put here as well. And then the village apartments is probably the most popular for our upperclassmen students. It is apartment style. You can also see that there is a community swimming pool in the village uh, and also one of the areas where University Police has a station. So great communities, a lot of different housing options for our students. So some of the things that you're thinking about as parents, uh, as, as you're planning ahead and your students are getting ready, important things to note is, as I stated before, students can select their own housing assignment. Um, they can check out all these options and more on our website. There's additional pictures and more details on each of those communities. So if any of them sparked your interest or you think it might be a good fit for your child, please feel welcome to get onto our website and check out more information. Uh, I ask that you read the information shared about living on campus. They're going to get an email when they submit a housing deposit that gives them a lot of information and a guide to living on campus and a guide on how to sign up. So reading that is really important. It really helps with their transition. And then we also have a frequently asked questions tab on our website that is super helpful. So again, accessing those resources uh, our website, again, wealth of information. And I get to check through that. So if you find anything, you're always welcome to email me and say, hey, this doesn't make sense. So our amenities, I've talked about these a little bit. So each room, each resident of the room will have one twin extra large bed, a closet slash wardrobe. So again, it's either an open closet or a closed wardrobe like you see in this picture, a desk, a desk chair. So each student is getting those basic amenities per room. Um, laundry is free for all of our, our residents, so you don't need to worry about sending your child to campus with quarters. That is free and open for use for all of our students. Uh, of course, we've got Wi-Fi out, uh, outfitted throughout our community, and we just are finishing up a major project with information technology to increase and improve our Wi-Fi across campus, so students are already seeing differences from that project. Uh, right now, we are op um, offering cable service. We are looking into streaming options for students as well, but we're, we're in a bid process for that right now. So stay tuned, that, that might change a little bit. And then all students do have mail services in their communities. What to bring and what not to bring. There's a link here at the bottom of the slide. I definitely encourage you to check this out and also look at it on our website. It is so important for me to emphasize what not to bring, but I also know you're thinking, what all do I need? Target, uh, Bed Bath & Beyond, and all those great big box stores have tons of extensive lists that say you need to bring all 90 of these items. I will let you know, uh, your students don't need everything on that list. They may want all of those things, but they definitely won't be able to fit them all into their room. So I, I've listed some suggestions for you. Storage crates are great. They can slide them under their bed and put things away that they might not need. Definitely some cleaning supplies. Most of our communities, they're gonna to need to bring, if they're in a suite configuration or apartment, they're going to need to bring their own shower curtain and hooks. Uh, if they're in a community bathroom, we obviously provide those for them. They're gonna to wanna to invest in twin extra long bedding, uh, surge protectors. We do uh, have a lot of issues with extension cords. Uh, you'll see that on our not approved list. Um, they need to be surge protected. So make sure as you're getting ready and sending them to campus that they, they have the right electrical equipment. Again, snacks, seasonal clothing. Um, sometimes they want a lamp so that way they're not disturbing their roommate with, an, with the overhead light on. And there's some, some, oh, I've got seasonal clothing twice. I'll, I'll update that. Uh, other things not to bring or that are prohibited. Uh, I share most of these because if your students are found in possession of them, they could then need to go to uh, go through our student code of conduct process. Candles and incense, candles and wax warmers are the biggest issues we run into. Please, I know many of us use those in our homes, but they are not safe for our residence hall campus. And as I'm sure you've experienced with your child, they might leave them unattended. So we wanna make sure they're not even thinking about bringing them to campus, even if they're decorative, even if it's the, you know a memorabilia that they really wanna have with them. Anything candles, incense, wax warmers, flammable items, keep those at home. 
Uh, they can't bring their own air conditioner. Most of our buildings do provide air conditioning, but not all. Um, they cannot bring, uh, you know, a window unit or a, a middle of the room stand up unit. They should not bring curtains. Again, fire hazard and extremely flammable uh, space heaters, subwoofers. Um, if they're having issues with the temperature in their room with regard to heat, we have um, staff available uh, with our facilities that one will repair the heat issue, but also in a pinch can provide approved space heaters if they're needed. Um, and oil diffusers, I, I see there, there's a, a question in there. Um, discouraged again, because they're extremely flammable. For the most part, students are encouraged to bring kind of the wall plugs. Um, I think they have like clay wall plugs and those type of things, or the kind of air fresheners that you can spray or that automatically spray, I think Febreze, the, the brand Febreze has something like that. So again, this is not a comprehensive list. There's a link here at the bottom, it's on our website of what to bring and what not to bring. Sometimes students really are like, well, I'm gonna bring it anyways. Again, I hope as a parent or guardian, you discourage that so they can avoid going through student conduct. So living with others, most students that are living on campus in their first year will have a roommate. And this is an adjustment. Many of our students that are coming to campus have never had to share a bedroom with anyone else. Um, so one, they can select their own roommate. They might meet them through an admissions event or through orientation um, or through different means of social media. So they are welcome to select their roommate and they would receive more information about that. Um, and then with regards to living with a roommate and hopefully as again, parents and guardians, you can help us out on this one. Remind them to be respectful, especially if this is their first time sharing space to communicate, cooperate and compromise. Living with others is hard. Um, try not to make assumptions. I think it's really easy if you get a random roommate to immediately try and find them on social media and assume who they are versus reaching out and asking them how they're doing. Um, and then again, residence life staff is there to assist and mediate if needed. So they can reach out to their community director or their RA to get further assistance if they're experiencing issues with their, their roommates. So selecting a roommate, I talked a little bit about this. They can self-select. Um, all residents do have the opportunity to complete basic preferences uh, about their habits and behaviors, but it's not a direct match. So a lot of times students are like, well, I said I like to stay up late and my roommate gets up early. Sometimes behaviors change. We've also found that sometimes parents fill out that information for their student um, to, to build the ideal roommate. And I would say just allow and encourage your students to do that uh, for themselves. And then again, there's some more ways to find a roommate if you're seeking to find a roommate. As parents, I'm sure you're curious, what is the cost? So this is our current room rates. This is per semester, and it details the buildings that I've shown you today. For the most part, first year students will be housed in those top two lines and are typically assigned to double occupancy rooms unless they are seeking special accommodations. We will not know the rates for 2021-2022 until in the summer when, when the board approves those rates. But this will give you an idea of what to anticipate for the cost of the room. Leave this up there for a minute. This is also on our website under um, one of our tabs. It says rates, it's very easy to find. Uh, and it also gives you more information about um, some of the other areas on campus and how this all connects. So safety on campus. Uh, again, as parents, I know you're thinking, my student's moving on campus and I might not see them for a few months. We have lots of support on campus and some great initiatives to ensure student safety. As parents and students, you can all sign up for our mobile and email alerts with Rave Alerts. There's a link there for you. Um, you get text messages, you get follow-up emails through this system. Uh, we have the eTips tip hotline, uh, which again is through our Guardian Safety app, um, and students can directly send tips to university police. So we've actually seen this in roommate conflicts where a roommate has an issue with their other roommate who's maybe having a social event that's unapproved uh, and they'll send an anonymous tip to the police and then our staff gets to 
show up on scene and say, hey, what's going on? How can we help? Uh, the the ETEPS hotline is, is really great and beneficial to students. And we also have blue, we're a blue light campus, which means we have emergency call boxes located throughout campus, easily recognized by the blue light with a phone. Uh, and the way they're set up on campus is that you should be able to move from, from one blue light to another. So if a student feared that they were maybe being followed, they would be able to activate the, the blue light call box and transition to the next blue light in, in sight. So lots of different safety mechanisms on campus. Some other important information and dates to remember. Housing deposit is due by May 1st. Um, this is priority uh, for first year students. So if you sign up later, you definitely can, but if you're looking for priority as a first year student to sign up, you wanna make sure that they're paying that housing deposit by May 1st. Guests are permitted. We're currently operating under some COVID guidelines, but we're hopeful that by the fall, we can go back to some of our more regular guest, uh, guest allowing uh, guest requirements. Um, parents and guardians are able to assist students with move in and move out and can visit throughout the year. We do have some guidelines about guests that are visiting or staying on campus that are under 18. Um, and so there's more information specific about guests and depending on how COVID-19 pandemic is progressing, that may change again for fall. So just stay tuned on that, but do know that we, we do allow for guests to visit the buildings. I talked a lot about the prohibited items list. I cannot emphasize this enough. The amount of students I meet with every semester for possession of those items is, is lengthy. So um, I, I see that people are dropping questions. Unfortunately, I know that Janika and I are dealing with some on-call stuff. So if you haven't gotten an answer yet, I will make sure we get to those, um, and it looks like Shanika is getting to some of them for all of you. So we will we will get to all of your questions, and if not, we'll send you a follow up. So that is the basics of our presentation. You can see our primary contact information on there. Again, my name is Tori Aliska. You're more than welcome to find me on the website. Send me a direct email and say, "Hey, I was a parent in." The, the Res Life session you did on March 30th. I just wanted to ask you some questions and I will do my best to get you answers to your questions. Great, Tori. Um, so we have about 18 questions that are still in the Q&A if you just wanna go one by one. All right, so what is a block on the meal plan and what is the benefit of having a block as opposed to a credit card? I will be 100% honest with all of you on this answer, I am not dining services and I do not want to misspeak. Their website has extensive information about the meal plan. Um, maybe Janika can drop a link to their website. If not, I, I will try to, to do that. Um, but I, I know that students overall like the meal plan and uh, there's a lot of options there. So. I, I wish I could give you the specifics, but I do not want to speak incorrectly. Um, how do we request housing location and remain? So if the housing deposit is submitted by May 1st, the student will receive an information packet that details out all the information about when they will be able to select their room, how they can designate a roommate, and what information needs to be submitted to designate that person as their roommate. So all of that specific information in detail is shared by our housing operations team to any student that has submitted by the priority deadline. Um, if you don't submit by the priority deadline, you may not have the opportunity to select, you may be assigned depending on where we are with our occupancy and capacity. Janika, do you wanna answer your question? I uh, can go on to the next one. Will a campus okay. visit be permitted before the fall semester? That is a wonderful question. Um, we are taking it day by day. Uh, we don't have a lot of insight. As of right now, we are not providing in-person open houses um, as we typically would. Uh, Nares, you might have some more information on in-person events and visits. I know that the admissions office um, is doing uh, campus tours a smaller version of our traditional campus tours. So if they go onto the Montclair undergraduate admissions website and go to where it says, visit us, 
um, you can sign up for one of the uh, smaller campus tours. Thank you. All right. Um, are the Wi-Fi improvements making a good thing better or an inadequate thing bearable? Will the improvements be complete? So the improvements should be complete, I believe, by next week. They're in their last community now. Um, things have been good, but what we found is as a result of students remaining in their rooms and not going to in-person class, they were overloading our Wi-Fi capabilities because they might have their cell phone, their roommate's cell phone, a tablet, uh, um, a laptop, their roommate's laptop, a, uh, a TV, all pulling on the Wi-Fi signal. So we're really just expanding the ability to hold more devices across campus and putting more access points into common areas that students frequently visit. Uh, so I would say from my experience so far, all of our residence halls have had really good Wi-Fi with the exception of one. And that's where they've spent the most time making improvements. Um, and most of that has been the result of uh, it being in a shared food court area where there, there were a lot more students visiting and trying to do schoolwork outside of their room. So uh, to answer that question, it's, it's just making it better. Okay. Looks like Janika's answering that one. So are there kitchens in the common areas of the residence halls? Yes, all of our communities do have a community kitchen available to residents. Um, depending on COVID guidelines, there may be a sign up, um, but for the most part, students can use those areas. I think the only area that doesn't have a full kitchen for use, but has a kitchen at area is Bone. Uh, Janika, you can jump in and correct me if I'm wrong on that, but I think all of our other areas and communities have a community kitchen that can be used. Ken Fishman, oh, go ahead, Janika. No, that's correct. Good. Yes. <laughs> all right. Can first year students get a single? It's possible. It's definitely possible to get a single, um, but it is not the most common. The most common is going to be a double configuration where they're sharing. Uh, we do work closely with our Disability Resource Center, so we do know some students come in needing accommodations and needing their own space. So if that's the case, uh, we will work with their accommodations and ensure that they, they have the accommodations that they need. Microwave ovens and refrigerators are allowed. Um, there are specific guidelines related to microwave ovens and refrigerators. Uh, there can only be one per bedroom. Um, so students can't each bring their own mini fridge into their bedroom. Um, and yeah, that's probably the biggest thing, but to find specific dimensions and wattage requirements or um, restrictions, please visit our website to find that specific information. When will the email regarding dorm selection and roommates, as well as the link to questionnaire be sent to incoming students? We already submitted housing deposits. So, we really don't send any notification to students about housing until after the priority deadline has passed. So usually it is in sometime in the month of May, we will send the, um, we will send the, the information, packet and information to students that have submitted their deposit. We don't do it on a rolling basis because they're not able to select housing until after May 1st. And we find that if we try to send it out earlier, it does get lost and we get a lot more questions about it. How much is the housing deposit? Janika, I know you have this in your RA stuff, I think. Um, the housing application fee is $300. Um, and I believe for first year students is due May 1st. Yep, May 1st, $300. And it is not a deposit. As Janika stated, it is a housing application fee. Um, Sometimes people hear deposit and they're like, okay, so if I don't go to housing, I get that back. No, this is the application fee for housing. All right. Do you have to decide on housing at the same time you commit to Montclair? You do not. Um, you can commit to Montclair now if you've already been accepted and then you'll select housing sometime in May or June. So don't need to decide on getting housing. Um, the priority deadline, like we said, is May 1st. Um, but with that, um, you can always make a decision to reside on campus later. It just might not be guaranteed. We do try and guarantee housing for all of our first year students, 
And if you're not, if you don't submit that deposit and decide on to live in housing by May 1st, it's not guaranteed. Um, all right, if, if I put a deposit and in September decide we want to do virtual, of course, if it's available. So like I said, it's not a deposit, it is an application fee. Um, if we already have a roommate, how can we get them together? Again, you're gonna get all that information. Um, it looks like somebody's, maybe they had to jump off. We can try and pull that uh, email off. Um, if you already know of somebody, your, your child knows who they want to live with, they will get specific information about how to select a roommate. Usually they need to provide their name and their CWID and then they, it'll generate a roommate um, code for them. All right, what other questions do we have? Just in this email. All right. Other questions? I will. I'm right. seeing a few questions about choosing a residence hall and roommates. Um, so none of that information will come out until after May 1st. So we just want to make sure that all the deposits come in and then all of that information will go out. Thanks, Jacob. Mm -hmm. Oh. Can you explain global living into depth? Um, a, a little bit. So global living is, it's an area, it's actually in our upperclassmen area. So typically first year students aren't assigned there, but uh, we do have a population of international students that uh, attend Montclair State and we assign them to live in residence halls, whether they're first year students or not, because they can't immediately go home. And so they need an apartment style living arrangement so they have the ability to cook and provide for themselves over winter break when some of our dining options may not be available to them. So it's in, it's currently in the village apartments. It is, like I said, it's more for upperclassmen, but sometimes um, we've got international folks on the call that wanna know about this. And then if there are students that have a special interest in working with our international students or helping them transition to living in the states, they can also elect to live in that area. I hope that answered that question. Um, again, and we partner very closely with international student services with our global living community. So we're, we're trying to make sure the students that live there have a lot of support. Will you require COVID vaccine for September? We have no information confirmed yet about the COVID vaccine and if it will be required or not. Um, I'm sure folks have seen that Rutgers has already made the decision to move forward with that. Um, we want to ensure that if we make it a requirement, it's accessible to all of our students. And right now it's not accessible to everyone. So I think we may see some more decisions on that uh, as we get closer to um, the vaccine being available to everyone. Um, how competitive is the application process for the learning communities? Uh, it's not. It, actually, in recent years, we have not had a lot of students express interest in some of the communities, and so they've been taken offline. Um, the ones that remain are the ones that we've seen consistent interest in, but I would say if your student's interested in living in one of those, those areas, make sure they, they note it. All right, where can I pay the deposit? So if you have, if your student has um, decided they're coming to Montclair State and they've completed that information, they should then be able to use their net ID and process the, the next steps with their deposit through our residential management system. There's more on that on our website. Oh, I keep forgetting to do this. All right. Can first year students have a car on campus? Janika, tapping you. Not yeah, I was looking on the parking services website. It sure. seems like they may be able to, but I would confirm with parking services. I know we did allow it this year due to COVID. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not sure if that will stay in place. 
uh, for the fall because parking is a hot commodity on campus. Mm -hmm. can, can you post that link on that answer? Oh, yes, I can. Thank you. Uh, is the housing application fee a part of the total residence hall room cost? You know, that's a great question. I need to get you an answer on that one. I, I believe it is a part of the total cost um, and it's factored into that total cost. If you wanna drop um, a, an email there, also make sure that that's clear on our website. Uh, let me just make a note about that. Um, housing app fee part of total cost. I'll make sure that's updated on our website by tomorrow, <laughs> if it's not there already. Thanks. Uh, transgender student, will there be a way for him to connect to possible roommates other than online? Um, will there be a way to meet other great, uh, I mean, great, I'm not sure. I know a lot of times students can meet through orientation. Um, our Office for Social Justice and Diversity may also be a great resource for them to reach out to and get connected with the community. Um, and Janika, could you have anything other to add? I know you worked with Stonewall Suites in the past. Um, no, I mean, they can um, reach out to the Office for Social Justice and Diversity. Um, I'll, I'll link that in as well. Awesome, thank you. Mm -hmm. Global living, we did take a little bit of time to, to answer about global living. Bottom line, before May 1, our first year gets housing. If the students go remote due to COVID, do they get their money back? I think it's gonna depend on what the, the contract says. So make sure before they uh, sign their housing licensing agreement, they take time to review it. I know a lot of times we don't take time to review those, but the license agreement is not that long. Um, it, this year, some students were released in the fall and when the decision was made to be mostly virtual, um, but not as many students were released in the spring because a lot of our classes are currently in person. Um, but I would say just make sure you review that license and dining agreement. For the most part, if you sign up, for housing and want to live on campus, it is, uh, and you do that by May 1st, it's gonna be guaranteed and it will not be, um, the money will not be returned or, or refunded. Kinko's working on that one. Answer live. Are common bathrooms, what are they like? Um, so it depends on the floor and the area. So I currently live in a common area in Bone Hall and it's one part of a wing. There are three bathroom stalls, three shower stalls, and three sinks. And underneath the sinks is storage area if the students choose to use it. They must use a key code in order to access the bathroom. So it's not open to everyone. It's just the students on that floor would know the key code to get into their bathroom area. Um, some areas may have more bathrooms or less bathrooms. If it's a smaller wing, there might only be two stalls two uh, toilet stalls, two shower stalls, and two sinks. Um, it really, it's gonna depend on which community they're assigned to and what floor of that community they're assigned to. In Stone Hall, there's, I, I mentioned there's two, full, uh, two floors and an annex. There's two bathrooms per floor. And there's at least four bathrooms, four showers, and four sinks in those bathrooms. So again, it, it does vary based on the community. Which are the closest residence halls to academic buildings and the farthest? Uh, the farthest are definitely our Clove Road neighborhoods. So that is, um, let me see if I can take you back to, so all of these communities that tend to only be for our upperclassmen students are the farthest from our academic buildings. They are located off of Clove Road, which is one of the roads that kind of leads into campus. Um, I would say beyond that community, um, I, I, it really depends. So Freeman and Russ Halls are on one side of campus, uh, but like I said, that's a really popular area for our art students, so it's really close to their arts communities. Um, so yeah, it, I mean, it kind of depends on the experience, what, their, what classes they'll have. Um, 
a student hasn't received an official acceptance. So they should get that soon. I'm not, nurse, do you have more on the acceptance? I know it's on a rolling basis. It's on a rolling basis. Um, they should contact the admissions office. We're trying to find that. Okay, I found that. Uh, you can go on to the next one. I'll answer that one. Great. Uh, are females and males on the same floor? Yes. Uh, for most of our communities, that would be the case. Uh, if it is a traditional hall with a shared bathroom, the bathrooms will be split by gender. So the, it may be a, a wing of females and then a different wing will be male students. If it's suites or apartments, the sex will vary based on, um, based on the unit. So that specific suite or apartment. And we do have gender inclusive housing for students. If they have individuals they want to live with, they can identify those individuals and request to have gender inclusive housing. A tour, we're coming to the end of our session soon. So perhaps if you want to put your email address in the chat uh, feature. Um, there are just so many questions, guys. The, the team has done a phenomenal job of answering 71 questions so far. So please review those uh, answered questions to see if your question has already been answered. Again, I'm gonna drop my email in the chat, I will also go back to our contact page. I do strongly encourage you to reach out to reslife at montclair.edu. I also know that you will find a lot of information about uh, some of the questions that you're asking through our website. I do see some questions about move-in dates. We are still waiting for confirmation, but it looks like we may still attempt to do an extended move-in period starting in mid to late August. Um, if a student lives in a suite, they are responsible to clean their bathroom. They can make a plan through their roommate or suite agreement to make sure that they're cleaning. Again, that's why we recommend bringing some cleaning products and they'll need to bring their own shower curtain and hooks as well. Um, are there residence halls that are more popular with athletic teams? Um, Yes, no. I think it really depends. I, I know we've got a lot of athletes that select to live in the heights that eventually move on to live in the apartments, again, based on class schedules, training over winter break, and those types of things. Um, but I've also seen plenty of athletes in Blanton and then first year students live in Bone, too. So, really, really depends. Um, we have an interesting question I've never seen before <laughs> uh, from, are there barbershops and grocery stores near every dorm? So you want to uh, talk about the Montclair Township? Uh, I'll talk a little bit. Janika, maybe you'll jump in. Um, the way Montclair State, uh, let's, yeah, thanks. Um, the way Montclair State exists is we're kind of a community on top of a hill. Uh, and so we're really uh, a college bubble feel. Uh, surrounded by three different cities located in two different counties. So we are Montclair State University. We use Montclair State as our city, but we also fall in Little Falls and Clifton. And um, students might not notice that, but I know we, we talk about a lot here just because of our relationships with the different communities surrounding. Uh, there is close access to grocery stores, barbershops, but it is not as easily accessible from campus because we're kind of like up on, on a hill. So really depends on, on what they need, what they want access to. A lot of students will, will carpool to get to some of those amenities. Janika, I don't know if you wanna add anything from your experience with the local community. There are buses um, that pick up students from New Jersey Transit directly on campus, on the front end of the campus. There's also, we are, we have two train stations directly on our campus that take people into town. Um, Montclair itself is not that far away. So you're able to actually, I was a student at Montclair many years ago in undergrad. You're actually able to walk to um, the actual town itself from the front end of the campus. So if they're okay with walking, uh, you know, less than a mile, I would say, um, they're able to get to the main Montclair town, so on Val off of Valley Road. Yep. Great. Um, I think we linked to this. 
Uh, on the acceptance letter received, it indicates deposit to live on campus, housing guaranteed. Is that the same as the application um, we just mentioned? I'm not sure about 550 total. That may be something else combined there, but it is it is $300 for the housing application fee. That was probably a combination of the tuition deposit. Mm -hmm. um, that's probably what this person is referring to. Thank you. Well, yeah, great job, ladies. That was so many questions, a record of over 80 questions. All right. Looks like Janika's dropping in some information about the train stations. Um, it is through New Jersey Transit. I'm sure Janika's going to add some of that information. Um, yes. Yeah, so thank you, everyone. Thank you, Tori. Thank you, Janika. Uh, Tori did provide contact information as you're seeing on the screen. If by any chance you think of another question that you wanna ask, please feel free to reach out to reslife at mail.montclair.eu. This is not the last webinar that we'll be doing. Uh, we have more scheduled and there is one coming up with ResLife and dining services. Uh, so if you're interested in that, check out the MSU website for upcoming events. Um, Thank you once again to everyone. I know that this was a lot of information shared today. So many great questions. We really appreciate everyone for coming. Thank you all. Thank you.